It is nice to be back outside again. Uh, now that the uh, weather is a little more cooperative and it's uh, pleasant out, I thought I would uh, begin some of our lessons on the outside. It's uh, very pleasant today uh, here in our little town. And uh, we are reaching the end of our, of our study of, uh, of the Gospel of John. We've had a delightful time with, uh, oh goodness, uh, nearly two months now, studying the, uh, the Gospel of John and uh, working toward uh, the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection, of course. And our lesson today is from chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, uh, verses 19 to 29. Uh, and uh, those are the... Uh, <clears throat> the occurrences in which Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection in the upper room. Uh, we have, uh, I remember, I don't know if they still do it or not, but I remember as a child uh, in our little town newspaper, they always put an article of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And uh, there was always some strange thing that was difficult to believe that was printed there. Uh, and, uh, and when we come to this lesson today, which of course is Jesus' resurrection and his post-resurrection appearances, uh, at least two of them, to his disciples, uh, that is definitely a believe it or not moment. Uh, uh, we have a saying, of course, believing or seeing is believing. Now, uh, Sometimes we, we don't really believe our eyes, and we would say, I can't believe my eyes. Uh, and uh, we, of course, uh, they tell us we forget most of what we hear anyway. But uh, <clears throat> this is a real believe it or not moment in the, in the, uh, in the history of our, of our faith in Jesus Christ, in which he appears to these disciples. They had to be convinced uh, in order to sacrifice their lives for the gospel, they had to be thoroughly convinced of its truth. Uh, now, some of the, the apostles, uh, and maybe some disciples, we don't know how many exactly were in the group, but uh, they were hiding out behind locked doors. Uh, we, <laughs> we suppose that they assumed that they were on the wanted list because uh, it was quite common in those days that uh, any time a, uh, a political prisoner uh, had to be rounded up and executed, then uh, most of his followers and many times all of his family were also wiped out. So uh, <clears throat> that may have been the case, we're not certain. But uh, now they're together again, and some of them have claimed to have seen Jesus. Uh, They're all very confused. This is, of course, a very confusing time. Uh, Thomas had heard their eyewitness testimony, but his ears <laughs> refused to believe because his eyes had not seen. Uh, he was not present on that first occasion. Uh, and uh, so he, he missed all of the excitement of Peter and the women and the men who had been on the road to uh, Emmaus, but they were all firmly convinced by now that they had actually experienced the presence of the risen Savior. Uh, uh, Peter, who had, uh, uh, who had had a special revelation, we don't know how that happened. We just know that Peter said he had seen the Lord. Uh, and then, of course, we know the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus from, from Luke's gospel. He shares that rather in detail for us. Uh, now, uh, he, he met with that, uh, that little group, that first little group on, uh, on that first Sunday evening, but Thomas was not there, and he simply could not believe it. So we'll look at those two appearances in our lesson for today from chapter 20. I'll read the first ones. Uh, we'll read first from uh, 19 to 23. That's uh, fairly long passage there. So uh, when it was evening that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, 
Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Uh, now, the disciples, after, after this, uh, this encounter, of course, uh, they, they, even before the encounter, naturally, but they were fearful. They were fearful both of the Jews and probably as well they were fearful of the Romans. Uh, they were behind locked doors. We, we hear that said clearly here. And suddenly Jesus was there with them. Now, John doesn't really uh, record their surprise as did Luke. Luke uh, gives us a full record of their total surprise and disbelief. Uh, but John simply presents here his appearance as evidence of the resurrection. Uh, John also remembers the first time he gave that commission. He had told his disciples those very same words uh, at a previous time. He speaks about a new process now of forgiveness. No more sacrifices. Uh, John does not elaborate much here, but on verses 22 and 23, uh, they're a little perplexing to us because uh, Jesus said that... Uh, the sins that you forgive have already been forgiven in heaven. And the ones you don't forgive haven't been forgiven in heaven. Uh, as I say, John does not elaborate on that verse. But uh, the forgiving of the apostles is written in the present tense. The forgiving in heaven is written in the past tense. Uh, whatever sins you forgive have already been forgiven. Uh, perhaps he's saying to them and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that they will be able to discern the truly forgiven persons based on the new message that, that they proclaim, which is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the last, is the very last sacrifice that is necessary. There is no longer need for the high priest. There is no longer need for the priest who, who celebrate with the repentant sinner in the holy place. Now this, of course, was terribly difficult for a practicing Jew to accept. Uh, the very idea uh, that there was forgiveness because of what Jesus Christ had done was very, very difficult. Uh, for centuries, they had been sacrificing animals in their place for their sins. And it had to be repeated over and over and over after every sin. And now what uh, John is telling us here, the sacrifice is over. Uh, we will have no more sacrifices. The sacrifice has been made. Uh, the sins of the repentant are forgiven. Uh, they do not have to do it again. So uh, that's uh, pretty powerful pretty powerful stuff there that uh, is still difficult, I think, for most people to understand. I, I certainly have difficulty understanding all that's involved in Jesus taking my place on the cross and the, and the need that uh, I do not or cannot make any sacrifice uh, with reference to my salvation. Now, our second group of verses, 24 and 25, just two of them there, uh, the group was back together again. Uh, it's a week later now. And uh, Thomas, uh, who is known as uh, Didymus as well, that's an interesting term. It means twin. So we don't know who his twin was, but he had a twin. And his nickname was the twin. Uh, and this time, uh, Didymus was with them. Thomas was with them. They had all declared uh, to him that Jesus 
uh, had resurrected. Uh, and remember that uh, Thomas had uh, almost become belligerent in, say, in saying that unless he touched his hands and put his hand in his side where the spear had wounded him, that he could not believe. Uh, <laughs> he said, I will believe only with irrefutable evidence. Uh, there are still people like that who want to have all the evidence present. And uh, it's interesting that uh, on this occasion, Jesus provided it. Uh, I'll read those two verses. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, he is really looking for some hard-nosed evidence here. Uh, he's, he's one of these persons who says, uh, for me, I have to have proof. Now, a week has passed. Uh, they're all together again here. And they were careful not to be obvious still. So again, they were behind locked doors. Uh, this time, of course, Thomas was with them. And suddenly it happened again. While they were discussing and trying to figure out what on earth is going on here, uh, wondering what's happening, there was Jesus again, right in their midst. He just appeared, standing among them. And again, he greeted them in the old familiar way. Peace, brothers. <laughs> I can only imagine uh, the emotion, the surprise, uh, uh, the the terror, whatever every emotion must have run through their what must have run through their brains at the, at this moment. Uh, it was like it was like thunder, <laughs> right in that little room. Uh, and then he turned directly to Thomas. Uh, <laughs> Here, Thomas, go ahead. He says, reach out your hand. Uh, you wanted to touch uh, uh, the nail prints in order to believe, so touch and believe. Uh, Thomas, of course, was totally overwhelmed, uh, as as anyone would be. Uh, and now he, he can't say anything. He, all he can say is, my Lord and my God. He, he just It just all came to him. It, it, it was like a, a wave washed over him. And he realized everything that's been going on has been God's plan, and it has been true and is true forever. It was a total recognition on Thomas's part. <laughs> Interestingly, Jesus did not even reprimand him for having not believed. He just said, uh, you want proof, Thomas? Okay, I will give you proof. Uh, and in his own way, I think he proves it to anyone who, who has honest, serious doubts. He just said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen and touched. Uh, and uh, uh, let, me, let me read that whole passage there because it's, it's fascinating to see that, uh, that encounter. And this is from uh, verses 26 to 29. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them, of course. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and that's a euphemism for they were all locked in, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your fingers and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. Jesus, Jesus knows that, uh, that our belief uh, that we have today actually comes from the testimony of those early believers. We have, we have no other evidence of that. Uh, so their witness and their testimony had to be absolutely ironclad. It had to be so strong 
that it could not be doubted in any way by any of them. Uh, and it was strong enough. It was strong enough to reach across the centuries. Uh, their witness will be confirmed by the Holy Spirit uh, through the centuries, not by our eyes, <laughs> not by our eyes or by our hands touching, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the convicting and convincing power of the Spirit of God within us assures us that these things are true. Uh, Jesus never spoke uh, harshly to a doubter. Uh, that's uh, sort of interesting to us because we sometimes speak harshly <laughs> to doubters. But Jesus did not speak harshly to doubters. Rather, he simply convinced them of the truth. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's worth saying here that we, when we have doubts, we need to face them. We need to recognize them. And we need to deal with them. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot live carrying our doubts forever. We need to resolve our doubts. Now, the resurrection of Jesus has been well proven by many, many, many uh, different uh, routes. But even religious people still have trouble believing it. Uh, there are people who claim to be Christian who, who will <laughs> deny the physical resurrection of Jesus. So uh, this is a believe it or not moment. So we believe it or not. But the fact is, he arose. I found it, um, I found ten times in the New Testament uh, when Jesus was seen by other witnesses to confirm his, his resurrection. I'll, I'll just run over those as we come to the end of our lesson today. Uh, it, one was to Mary and to the other women. They have fairly good evidence of, of uh, what they saw. Then to Peter, we do not have details on that one, but Peter claims to have had a, an encounter with the resurrected Lord early on in the first two or three days. Number three, the men on the road to Emmaus. Now, when you read that story in Luke, uh, there is no room for doubt there. Uh, they spent the whole day with him and, and listened to him expound the scriptures to them. Uh, and, uh, and then at the last moment, of course, as they set to break bread, uh, then they recognized him. Uh, number four, to the ten who were behind locked doors on that first uh, Sunday evening uh, when they were together, and then to the eleven the week later, and they were still behind locked doors, and he appeared again. And number six, he appeared to the disciples in Galilee somewhere on that mountain uh, that uh, he had promised them to meet them there. Uh, and then to the disciples who after a night of fishing, there were four or maybe six of the disciples who had decided to go fishing. And early the next morning, Jesus was waiting for them on shore with fish and bread all ready for breakfast. So uh, that group of disciples saw him and spoke with him. Uh, then to the 500, Paul speaks about the fact that there were 500 people in one group who saw the resurrected Lord in, somewhere in Galilee. Uh, and then Paul, of course, on the road to Damascus, proclaims that he had had a personal encounter with the risen Lord. And then uh, the tenth one is the disciples were together with him on the day of ascension, and they stood and watched him rise into the clouds and had the testimony of heaven. <laughs> this time, as the Bible says, uh, the testimony or the witness of two confirms the thing. Well, not only did the disciples see Jesus rise that day, uh, there were two angels who also confirmed it. So we have an earthly confirmation by the, by the disciples, and we have a heavenly confirmation uh, by two angels from heaven. So we have heaven's witness and earth's witness that our Lord is a risen, powerful Lord. Let's give him thanks. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love. Thank you for the beautiful world that you've allowed us to live in. And thank you, Lord, that you're going to make it more beautiful one day. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, as you went, you promised you would return. 
and we await, we await your return with, with some degree of anxiety and with lots and lots of hope. In Jesus' name, amen.